So Amanda wrote this great book. I'm sure you've all read it, heard of it, may or may not know the plot line. But it's basically about her year, her character's year dating on Match.com for a year in New York City. It's crazy. She's got a lot of great stories. And so we have a full panel here of dating experts to discuss. So to start, you guys all kind of have dated in different eras, different landscapes. Susan, you were kind of pre-internet. Is that you're a bit different eras? Different eras. Do you look, do you look um, right at Different it? time periods, different decades, centuries. I don't know how you want to say yes, it. Yes, we send each other notes on stone <laughs> tablets. <laughs> it was the Flintstone era. <laughs> so you're pre-internet. Amanda, you're kind of in between when dating sites are starting to pop up, and Hannah only knows the apps, essentially. Um, so tell me kind of how technology has played a role in dating and how it changes these days. Just go down. I'll start. All right. Um, so I think I was on that like transitional period, on the transitional period, um, where we're in you know, people from my generation um, came about going on regular people dates where we met people in, you know, the grocery store. I used to park myself in Barnes and Noble and pretend I was reading like a really fascinating book and hope that I would meet someone that way. Um, and by the then, way, I think that was Generation X. <laughs> I believe that's what it's called. My grandma once told me to go to the 92nd Street Y and just park down in the lobby. I was like, that's not how you meet people. I hear that's a hot place to meet men, says Susan. But um, so then it started changing and and Match.com and JDate and some of those sites came into being. And it was, you know, part of the reason that I wrote the book, and unfortunately I wrote it like a couple, a long time ago, publishing moves at a glacial pace. And so there's um, some of the pressures and changes and things that were a little bit more difficult to navigate back when I was going through it. Like the taboo side of it is totally irrelevant now. You know, when I remember when I wrote the book, um, we all had friends who were meeting online and everybody had their story like, oh, we met at the post office, where post office was like code for JDate. And um, I sort of felt like that was such a silly thing that we would be embarrassed about where we were meeting people, especially when it was enabling like such great connections. So um, that was, I was on that cusp, but now you say that out loud and it's just so silly because you can't imagine a world where they didn't exist or how we would ever find people otherwise, so. It's like weirder to meet someone in real life than yes. on an app. If you say like, oh, we met in real life, you're like, hmm, okay, weird. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I never knew that. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, you kind of met your boyfriend in real life, but like with the help of an app. With the help of apps. Um, so yeah, I mean, my entire adult life has literally been shaped by dating apps in one form or another. Um, apps and sites existed when I came to the city for college and uh, they were really big like when I was I don't know junior year of college everybody was exploring tinder for the first time and that summer after my junior year of college when I started working as a matchmaker that's how I would go find people for my clients to date a lot of the time um, I would spend like eight hours on different apps swiping through and that's how I would find people so that was literally my job that's how I made my living um, and then after college when I started writing this book of course you can't really write a book about dating in the 2010s without writing about dating apps. So that's something I was doing. Um, and that's still my job today. I'm a dating editor at Elite Daily. It's a site for millennial women. So of course, you know, I write about dating apps all the time. Um, and of course, I met my boyfriend on Hinge, which is a dating app. And um, he's the iPhone engineer for the app. So I owe a lot. <laughs> I owe a lot to dating apps. So thank you very much. Um, I mean, when I was in the dating world, um, there we did not use apps. We did it the old-fashioned way by, you know, friends would introduce you and at weddings and at house parties and all of that. And it's funny because now I'm, I sit in as the deputy editor of Cosmopolitan magazine where we spend a lot of time talking about dating and all different kinds of sex. And um, <laughs> The youngins at the office are, you know, they like with rapt attention, like, what was it like in your day? And they're like, how did you possibly? And they can't say, I just, it's, it's not possible to meet someone, you know, without an app. And I'm thinking, generations of people <laughs> coupled up without apps. Um, but th the one thing I always tell them is that even though the platforms have changed, I think the rules are still the same. We can get to that later. I like that. And you guys have all three of you have written books about dating. How much of it is based on your own realities or stories you've heard from your friends? 
Oh my God. <laughs> um, I read a dating book, it was a long time ago now. Is he the one? 101 questions that will lead you to the truth. Um, I promise you every single question came out of a bad date. Um, yeah, so I mean, that it's kind of why I wrote the book was because um, as I meandered through the world of dating in New York and suffered through so many terrible pasta primaveras, um, it was like, I you started thinking- You eat on your dates? What's it? You eat on your dates? Okay, so here, okay, okay, no, no. It's not very ladylike. Yes. No, but here's the thing. I had code with my girlfriends. So if you went on a date and you didn't like the guy, you ordered the salmon. It was the most expensive thing on the menu. <laughs> If you, liked him, if you liked him, you ordered the pasta primavera. It was the most inexpensive thing on the menu. So then it, it became like, oh, how was your date? Pasta. Ooh, how was yours? Salmon. <laughs> it's like shorthand. That's great. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good it's a good way to go. I feel like people do drinks now first. Okay. People do drinks now. Right, right, right. Like I would never go eat on a first date. I, I, I that's what I'm saying. No one eats on first yeah. dates anymore. But that's that's like a huge difference even a part in of generational. <laughs> I mean, a meal isn't even part of a first date. No. Right. It's drinks or coffee, right? Right. I wouldn't yeah. do a coffee date. I don't, well, I don't drink coffee, but I also just like, there's no end. There's no excitement. You're not drunk. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, liquid courage definitely helps on a date. Plus, coffee date is like, it more. it feels like an interview and you, and you don't want to feel that way. You know, it's like during the day, what do you wear? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. Anyway, Hannah, Amanda, your reality stories. Um... So my, it's not a secret at this point, I've written a couple essays about it, but my, my book originally began as memoir, so a whole lot of it is, was true. Um, but in the sort of journey of fictionalizing it, um, a lot of things got changed. So first of all, like names and identifying details got changed, a number of the characters either became combined or composite characters. Um, but the experiences, almost all of them happened to me. So um, but whether it was like the exact specific setup of the date or, you know, the conversations or feelings or things that emerged from them, that was my reality. And I thought it was um, informative in so many different ways, which is why I decided to turn it into a book. But it is fiction now. So we say it's um, inspired by my story. But now Allison. Yeah. Um, so here's my book. Comes out in June. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's also really good. Pick it up. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's about a young matchmaker who graduated from NYU, doesn't get her dream job, winds up working as a matchmaker for an elite dating service. She's the youngest one at the company and feels really, really out of her league. She knows nothing about love. She knows nothing about how to work. And that is what I did. Uh, so that part is all true. Um, a lot of the events in the book are fiction, but I mean, Instagram stalking, cute guys, that's real. Jamie asked me if I ever did that, yes. There's a really great scene in her book where this guy, she went to set up with someone, kind of said no, and he posts on Instagram, and he posts the location, so she shows up, and she's like, listen, just give me a shot here. And it is so creepy and amazing. <laughs> I can't wait to read it. Oh, thank you. It was like, oh, I would do that. <laughs> you feel like you find yourself. Anyway, obviously with the apps, you're always just kind of, it doesn't work out, you can swipe to find the next best thing. Julia, you're kind of here for our statistics. How many connections turn into dates and how many first dates turn into second dates? Okay, so um, on Match, you're more likely than any other site or app to actually turn the messaging and the talking online into a reality and go on a first date. And there's a few reasons for that. Um, one, it's not free. So, you know, people want to get what they paid for. And, uh, and, and it's more effort than being on an app where you just swipe um, because you uh, talk to each other and your profile is richer and lengthier. So you actually have to take the time and effort to answer questions and to write things about yourself. And so effort plus paid membership equals going out in real life. <laughs> and also more people on Match than any other site go on second dates than first dates. Do you think there's a lot of crossover if you're on Match or also on the apps or you're just strictly on Match? Um, I think there is some crossover, but I think that more people who are seri more serious about it are on Match as opposed to the other apps that are free. 
sense. And what's like, would you say the average user is? And how many love connections are there? Average age, I think I didn't say age. Okay, so there's uh, different groupings for aging, uh, for, the, for the generations. Um, but uh, so here are some stats. One out of three people end up in relationships that meet on match, and one out of five end up married. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's How many bra- that's dates do you have rights. to go on? And 31, 31, actually, this is interesting, 31% of uh, U.S. singles met their last first date on Match. Huh. So, yeah, it's worth your while, <laughs> I'd say. Now, the, um, the age groupings are it's about 32% are millennials, which is 18 to 36. Um, and then 39%, which is the largest percentage, are Generation X, uh, 36 to 52. And then there's the Baby Boomers, which is 50, 29, 27% is uh, about 52 to, uh, seven, 56 to 72. Okay, I like it. So, yeah. Good stats. <laughs> All right, so we debated this backstage, and you guys can obviously like, chime in. But with the internet, you can find anything about anyone within 10 seconds. I always Googled people before I went on dates. They are very against this, but I'm kind of curious how Googling, one, why you're against it, and two, how Googling someone changes your perspective going into a date. Well, first of all, just the picture itself. That can either persuade you or deter you from going out with the person, and you cannot tell chemistry by a picture. I argue about this all the time with my clients and the members of my database as a matchmaker. They are so adamant. I provide some pictures, but I, but I encourage them to meet them in person because you cannot sense the energy and the chemistry of a person from a picture. So that's first and foremost. Like you need to know if they're gonna kill you. Like you need to know if this is a murder. Well, I vet everyone, and everyone has a background check coming from me. So. But if you're like on Tinder, you're like, okay, this person's a lawyer. Like, That's why yeah, you, yeah, you they're meet not, them they're in not public. They're not vetted on Tinder. No. Well, you meet them in public, and you don't go home with them for a while until you feel comfortable. <laughs> I have a Google horror story. So when I worked as a matchmaker, <laughs> not horrifying. We're just... already at the horror stories. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well. On Google. <laughs> Google them after horror. your first date. Google them on your second date. Agreed. If you want to feel safe. <laughs> um, I had a client who, so we never gave out first names. If I was setting you up with my client, I would give her first initial and that's it because we didn't want people Googling because if you're like even just a little bit creepy, you have a first name, you can sort of figure out the rest of their life. So we only gave first initials. Um, in this one particular case, I wound up giving a match her first name and he knew a little bit about her, like sort of the neighborhood that she lived in. And he figured out her full name, found her YouTube channel, watched the YouTube channel, decided he found her voice really irritating and didn't want to go out with her. And she was already like en route to the bar and she was on her way to the date. Um, so with like 10 minutes left, I had to call her and say like, there is no date tonight, I'm so sorry. Um, and that, that's not fun. So we never gave out identifying information because we figured you can reject somebody after you meet them, but it's really not fair to reject somebody before you even meet them. See, exactly. and I think that's just good editing. So if he's the kind of guy who's going to be turned off by the sound of her voice on the YouTube channel, mm-hmm. eh, kick him to the curb. That's so true. Yeah, She's better with off with that. Annoying voice. Yeah. I mean, that's just not fair. But that's sort of what the Google is. We're starting is, a new dating right? service right here on the. <laughs> <show. laughs> no, it's like if we'll you get your profiles right, and that's the differences between the sites, right? Essentially, like Match allows for much more information than like Tinder, for example. And so you're sort right. of implementing your filters or, or weeding people out. Googling is just kind of taking that a step further. And I don't know that right. I have like strong feelings about whether I would or wouldn't do it. I, I, it went both ways and I didn't really have rhyme or reason and each time I either felt like, yeah, I'm so glad I did that. I learned so much before this date or else I'd be like, oh, I kept the surprise and right. like that element is so right. wonderful. I mean, we're all this. tempted to do it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but I also think it does pay off. I mean, especially if you're a little like jittery about it. And I think there's right. levels okay. to it. Like that was a deep dive going to someone's yeah. YouTube channel. It's more like, oh, let me look at your LinkedIn mm-hmm. to make sure you actually have a job. Right. right. I have sort of have, there's something I've always wondered about for the panel. Do we think that women are more empowered dating in this age than in the previous age? Yes and no. I think because I think that guys are also inclined to think, you know what, she's not into me. Let me go find someone else or something better out there. They'll keep swiping. But at the same time, I do think that women are more empowered in general and are more willing to speak up and not let a man walk all over them and kind of they pave their own way and what they want versus like being like a bending over backwards for some guy. 
I think we're certainly more empowered, but I'm not sure it's down gender lines. Like I think the men are more empowered as well. And I think we talked about this before, like when we were out at drinks and um, I was saying that in like the olden days when I was like on the pre-cusp side, um, I felt like you would spend all of this time like hunting, right? Like going out to bars, like wing womaning with your girlfriends on a Friday night and like hoping that someone would talk to you. I had like, I had really charming friends and so no one ever talked to me. And it would go like weeks and weeks and weeks and months and 10 months later, you're like, it's Friday night again. Like, I'm so excited. Last week didn't work out, but like maybe tonight. And some person would come talk to you and they all of a sudden didn't fit any of, you know, your boxes, right? Like they were not tall enough or they like had an annoying voice or weren't educated or whatever, but you gave them so much more of an opportunity because you're like, if you leave this conversation, it will be 10 more months until someone else talks to me again. And, right. and now, now you can just go online. <laughs> no, but and now you're there. And I think that, you know, it's it, like sort of power and, and choice are, are interrelated where you're saying, okay, this date is going well. But I'm not sure if it's perfect. And I do know that when I go home, like there will probably now be seven more people waiting in my inbox, like asking for a date for tomorrow or the next day, you know? And right. I think in a way it makes us um, empowered to be more choosy, which is good. But on the flip, you also are much more flaky and choosy. Right. It's a double edged, <laughs> it's a double -edged sword yeah. for sure. It's definitely empowering to know that there's more options available to you. Pressure off, you know, it, 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 that's, that's a that's a good thing but at the same time sometimes there can be so many options that you're always searching for what's next and wanting to know what's behind number, door number two three four and 400 you know yeah <laughs> that leads into my next question where do you think people are so focused on just kind of swiping through and looking for the next specs thing that today people aren't interested in settling down or have a harder time with it or just commitment in general i think it can enable someone to be non-committal or to be more non-committal. Um, but I think that when they're really ready um, and they've been through a certain am amount of experience um, and they really want to find that certain someone, then that they're gonna value something good. Nothing to add, okay, agreed. <laughs> um, so my next question, I mean, we kind of touched on this, but with so much technology and so much information out there about people, how do you get to know someone organically? Meaning outside of apps? No, not even, like just without Googling them and learning everything about them on Facebook. Once your Facebook friends are like, oh, this is their favorite musician, like, let me bring that up. Like, how do you really get to know someone organically without technology playing a role? I mean, I don't think anything takes the place of spending time with a human being. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Call me but crazy. I think people, I think millennials have problems doing that. I'm sorry? You mean you talk have... off of technology? Yeah. Talk off of text? You actually meet in person? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, and therein lies the problem. Uh, yeah, I don't think anything replaces actually spending time. And I always say, do, do something. You know, not just a bar or a meal. Like, go on a hike. Or I'm not that I hike, but you know. <laughs> But do something. Go to a museum. I don't know. Do do something. Experience something together. Um, I just I just don't think anything replaces that. Just quality time, and just the more time you spend, the more you get to know each other. I do think. Sorry, I do think technology has been great for introverts. Like I think True. That's, that's the big 100%. win. Are people who are super shy, very introverted, trouble connecting? I think that's the huge win for technology. I agree. Okay. Yeah, but if you're so shy and then you have to meet someone face to face, you can be super awkward and not as well, like well spoken or witty as you are over time. That's when you hire a dating coach. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, what are your top three tips for dating? First time daters, like your first date. First date, um, listen, ask good questions, be yourself. If you're nervous, pretend you're out with your best friend to ease your nerves um, and uh, don't Make it all about you. That's important to just ask questions and listen. And yeah, don't be a flake and be yourself. Be yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you suck and then don't be yourself. <laughs> On the note of giving dating tips, you work at Cosmo, you work at Elite Daily. How have you guys kind of seen the advice you give women in your publications change over time? And over like, what's kind of the new theme of dating and what are you telling your readers now? And as opposed to even five years ago? I mean, it, it is the, the drumbeat is empowerment. So talking to women about being true to themselves, asking for what they want, saying no when no means no. Um, it's all about empowerment. And in today's 
landscape. Um, I think this is, you know, an issue that everyone is talking about, thinking about. Me too. Just, you know, everyone's talking about it. So I feel like uh, Cosmo has sort of been there for a long time. We staked our our flag there long ago. Um, Helen Gurley Brown did it uh, 150,000 years ago when it was just considered, you know, absurd what she was telling women to ask for what they want. So we've just sort of amplified that. Um, and I don't know, I, I feel very proud of um, the message that we're sending and um, to, to young women because, you know, you gotta get what you want in this life. Amen. <laughs> um, well, Elite Daily, where I work, did not really exist five years ago, so I can't answer that. But um, you know, we we want to give women advice to be you know the most confident that they can be on dates, or the most confident that they can be in the bedroom. And it's not about you know being good enough for your date or for your partner. It's well, how can you find a partner that's good enough for you? Yes. 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 <laughs> Mic drop, that's all. <laughs> do you have more to add to that? No, that's all. I, I do actually, when you said a tip for it, she just reminded me a tip, a good tip for the first date. A lot of people are nervous because they're wondering what the person's thinking of them. Switch, flip your mindset if you're on a first date. And I always say, don't worry about that. Think more about what they're offering for you. I mean, I know you get a lot of, you literally write about dating every day, all day. What's the, the crazy story you've heard recently about someone's dating experience? Oh my God. Um, we need to hear. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of my favorites, whew, sorry, that's fine, um, that I saw this week, I didn't write it, another uh, staff member wrote it, but I loved this story about somebody on Tinder who accidentally swiped left on somebody that they really thought they liked. I saw this on Twitter. This? Yeah, I okay. saw it on Twitter. Yeah. Went really viral. Um, accidentally swiped left. If you've never used Tinder, that means reject, no, goodbye, you never see that person ever again. But he knew where she went to school, and he knew her first name. So he knew it was Claudia at Missouri State. So he, he was a student there, and he went through the database and emailed every single Claudia at <laughs> Missouri State until he eventually found her. And I think that's a really sweet story because you can, you know, on Tinder or in any dating app, it's really easy to think, oh, people are disposable. You can just swipe yeah. again, find a new soulmate. But he was like, no, this girl is special. This girl is worth the effort. So I thought that was really sweet. It's one of the most romantic things I've heard in a <laughs> I, very I agree. long time. I agree. I, but then she tweeted out, like, like, this for dude emailed generation. every Claudia. Like, she kind of Don't blew his Don't ruin the story. She kind of blew his cover. She made it less romantic, but fine, yes. <laughs> On that note, what are all of your worst dating experiences? If you had to just pick <laughs> one out of the thousands. Okay, just the other day, yes, I'm a single matchmaker, very recently single, so I'm on the market. Um, if anyone's available. There's, a, <laughs> there's, there's an app for that. <laughs> I, as a matchmaker, I say tell everyone you know you're single, you never know who they know. Um, so uh, a couple weeks ago, I myself was swiping on Tinder, and um, I'd been talking to this guy trying to get together with him, coordinating plans, and we finally did, we finally met up last Saturday. Turns out, I went out with him about six and a half years ago. <laughs> On one date, I had no idea. He says he had no idea, pretty sure he knew. Um, yeah, it was a disastrous first date, and here I was stuck with him again. <laughs> Oh yeah, this happened about two weeks ago, so fresh in my mind. Did it not work out the second time? I tolerated it. Yeah, he's a nice person. He was a—I think he's a nicer person than I thought he was the first time, but still not for me. You're a survivor. Oh yeah, to say the least. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to tell the worst date. Um, I'll tell because I'm married 22 years, which is amazing. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> husband's not here. Um, I, I, but I'll tell the story of, I, so I met my husband in a swimming pool at the YWCA because we, are bo we were both uh, avid swimmers. And, um, you know, it was this old-fashioned thing. We're in the pool and cap, goggles, speedo, ladies. Just wrap your brain around it. Not good. And we start chatting and we're sort of swimming sets together and, you know, we, we would chat. In, in the breaks and you know what do you do I worked at 17 magazine at the time and I was like okay well thanks for the swim gotta go he said well if someone wanted to get in touch with you how would they do that old-fashioned dating I said well you could just call me at the magazine 
I'm not going to. I'm so not, hard to get. I'm not going to give him so my, you know, my home number. I said you can just call me the her magazine. home number though, not her cell number. <laughs> the home. And I he called me the magazine, and he said, "Well, I don't even know your last name." And I said, "Swimmer," because that's my last name. And he thought I was blowing him off, obviously, um, and didn't call for weeks until he was coming through the airport and saw a display of 17 magazines at Hudson News and thought, let me just check that masthead. And there I was. Didn't lie. Great story. I love Such it. That's a good the best. Story. Your turn. Mine's we're, not that good. <laughs> no, would you do, do, do worst date. Do worst date. She yeah, just got an out because she's been married for so long. Um, one of my worst dates happens like five minutes from here because I went to NYU and um, it was just, like one of those dates where you have nothing to say to each other and like each person has a one word answer to everything and it's horrible and you want to leave. <laughs> oh. But he didn't want to leave. He says, let's go get gelato and sit in the park. So we went to Fresco on 2nd Ave and went to go sit in the park and uh, he, I wanted to get out of there really fast. He stuck the spoon into the, my cup of gelato, put it in his mouth, put it back into the, my cup, and then sort of pins me against a park bench and puts his tongue near my face and kisses me. And he says, now that I've had your germs in my mouth, I can have the real thing. Oh. <laughs> you can't do that in 2018, oh time's God. up. You, it was you 2013. Win. <laughs> and that's a story where I would say, and it's no wonder why he's single. So my theory is that it's really hard to have a bad first date. You evidently had one, but um, in general, I sort of have been of the mindset that as long as you go in like ex hoping to learn something, and it you know doesn't have to be about your date necessarily, it could be about like the new neighborhood that you're exploring with them, or a new job you never knew existed, or a new outlook or perspective. You're emerging net positive, so it's not a bad date. It's just like a date that didn't work out romantically. Um, so I tried to keep that like sort of thread and theme in the book, but I, I did have a couple. You did keep that. Not as the great. I, yeah, I liked it in thread. real yeah. life. Um, and I would say the worst was probably with someone who, when we showed up, he said, I looked you up on Facebook and I found that we have one mutual friend. She went to college with you and I dated her briefly a couple years ago. And then he spent the next 30 minutes like waxing nostalgic about the full curve of her lips and her super long legs. And <laughs> oh my God, that was definitely TMI. Date. Yeah. But yeah, also like I didn't learn a whole lot. So I was like, oh, bummer. But, you, <laughs> you learned about the curves of her lips. <laughs> you heard she's very beautiful. Did but... you go look her up on Facebook after? Be like, now I have to check these lips out. <laughs> <laughs> I knew her, we were friends. <laughs> and for you both, I feel like your books are both very realistic and people dating today will understand them and find themselves in that. What do you hope the average reader gets out of your book? They're reading it, they end it. What do you hope they walk away with? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's, um, Thank you. I feel like there were a lot of themes that I tried to weave into my book and um, to, to distill like the best one I'm not totally sure of, but um, I think it's probably that there are myriad people that we can work out with. And you know, she goes on many, many dates um, and meets many men. But my theory, like as I look back at all of these chapters of men, is that she probably could have ended up happily with at least five of them, maybe more. And I feel like it has a lot to do with timing. And um, you're a pro we're all products of our experiences. And so you're learning and adjusting each time you come out of a new relationship. And so I think that if you had tried, you know, actually at one point for various reasons, we were trying to reorder the book to build in like a, a sort of stronger work theme thread. And so we started re like reorganizing the chapters because I had this theory when I wrote it that it was um, like serial or episodic and each chapter could stand alone. And I still feel that way. But therefore, when we tried to rejigger them, I started reading it again and seeing that that wasn't entirely true because those little minor adjustments were would have changed like she wouldn't have reacted that way to the, to Paul if he'd actually come after Mark or or vice versa and so I think that um, it has a lot to do with sort of trying to keep an open mind and being open to the new experiences but thinking that there isn't like really one person for us ultimately like in this you know in, in the sea of Manhattan there are probably hundreds that we could be really happy with if just the timing worked out sorry <laughs> your turn just say your answer um, oh. yeah so I mean I don't want to give away the ending of my book and how it all comes together, but uh, there's one 
client who has a seven page checklist for what she's looking for in a partner. And it's insanely specific, like 5'11 to six foot one and must make over $200,000 a year and must love to parasail and hang glide and enjoy vineyard, what is it? Vineyard tours, there we go, winery vineyard tours. Um, she had 33 potential hobbies to share and celebrity lookalikes. And I was a matchmaker, but I was not a man factory and I could not <laughs> produce that. <laughs> I tried really hard, um, and I have to. I'm so with, I'm so with you on that. Mm. I mean, <laughs> we have story. Life story, yeah. Um, and there is a piece of advice in the book uh, given to me by a very dear friend, Morgan, who's sitting right here. And uh, when I was very sad about a boy one day, she said, "This was years ago. Um, you don't know what you're looking for. You're gonna find it. You don't know what it is yet." And that's a big theme in the book. The girl with the seven page checklist does not really end up happy. Having a seven page checklist does not guarantee you're gonna find your perfect partner. And dating is an adventure. Just enjoy it and see where it takes you. I have one question before we open it up to the audience. Do you think, and it kind of goes with what we were just talking about, do you think people are too picky or do you think that you deserve to be that picky? Too picky. <laughs> Double edged sword. I think um, too picky in certain ways. They don't know how to find common ground and compromise. They think that you know if they're not picky, then they're gonna settle. But what they have to understand is nobody's perfect, let alone themselves. And you're never, ever, 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 ever in a million years in your lifetime or any other lifetime you have gonna find someone that's a hundred percent of what you're looking for. You know, so people have to realize that. It's like I always say, you know, sometimes people come to me and they're looking for this unicorn and if only I had that magic wand, but I'm not a magician, I'm a matchmaker and we're real people, everyone's human. So they have to understand what it is that's most important to them and they can use that as a guideline, but everything else will just fall into place naturally. All right, I think it's time for audience q and Unless you guys have anything you want to add before people. All right, hit me with your questions. I'm going to bring around a microphone, try to make sure everyone can hear. Thanks, ladies. This has been so fun. You're obviously all dating experts, so I'm curious if you could go back in time and give your former self, your younger self, um, a piece of advice or insight that you have gained over the years. What would it be? I wouldn't cry as much. <laughs> so many boys made me cry, and I was like, that was stupid. They were mean and stupid. <laughs> like shake myself and be like that was dumb he was dumb boys are dumb <laughs> I'm gonna think on that I don't know <laughs> I'd say know know your self-worth and know what you're looking for and if somebody is not going to give you sort of what you want not in like a really bratty like wow I want to go to a Michelin star restaurant kind of way but like not give you respect just like move on and there's gonna be somebody else I actually think I would have told my younger self to put a little more effort in. <laughs> I, I don't, I was never focused on, you know, finding that true love. I was very focused on my career. I, you know, I, I think I would have told myself to just have a little more fun and, and, and yeah, and like explore a little bit more and um, not take anything so seriously. And yeah, I think I, that's what I, I would have told my younger self. So this is this is kind of embarrassing for me to admit, but uh, when I was <laughs> say, okay, when I was younger, I was not as wise, and I was definitely more superficial, and um, I really cared about style a lot and how they dressed and whether I liked their jeans or the shoes they were wearing, and <laughs> so it's little things like that that used to turn me off. Like my, I remember my mother used to say to me, "What's the matter? He wasn't wearing the right pair of jeans." Um, so I would tell myself, you know, to not worry about that or not, not focus on that as much, and that doesn't matter because everyone sees that in time. My question is for Susan. Um, do you think dating prepared you for marriage? Yes. How? And I'll tell you why. <laughs> and I think I was thinking about this a lot when we were talking about the checklist and all that. Marriage is about compromise. 
Marriage is about seeing the other side of things. Marriage is about not being, pardon the pun, wedded to your own ideas, opinions. That's marriage. And I think if you really go into dating, that's, it's, it's actually great, it's a great training ground for that. You've got to let some shit go. Um, and you've got to get a little disappointed. Um, I feel so lucky that I met my husband in this pool, but I will, I will tell you, the best, I say, great decision to marry my husband. The best decision I, of my life was leaving the last one, who was awful, who I stayed with for, for many years. Good for you. That was the best decision of my life, and it seemed like a very impossible decision at the time, and a humiliating one, because we'd been together so long, but that was the best decision. Just keeping, just being honest. I appreciate the honesty, that's great. Hi, um, so I feel like so much of our culture focuses on, like you guys talked about finding the one. It's like this big romanticized idea about finding the one and your big fairy tale story. Um, do you guys think not believing in the one sort of lessens the romance factor of it all? That you can be happy with anyone? That's your book, right? Yeah, that, that, that's the premise of my book. Did you so. read the book? <laughs> um, well, it only came out yesterday, so that's fair that you haven't. But um, no, I, I mean, my own, my own view is that um, you, can, you can just as easily get swept up and carried away by all these different people. And I think that, you know, there's, I don't really, like, I think if you go into it thinking that there's only one person for you, then when we were talking about being too picky, like, that's a recipe right away for, for being that way. And, you know, the, bringing it to the book a little bit, it was interesting because the, you know, when we talked about, like, um, magazine columns and advice changing for women, women's fiction, by and large, hasn't changed that much in their message. And so, you know, when you're reading for comp titles, when you're writing your book, um, you read very, very widely. And it was very hard for me to find a book that didn't have the premise that there was either a love triangle or a love duo, you know? And this theory that like, oh, you're gonna get something out of dating each of these people and any one of them could be the one. Is it like, is it gonna be Paul? Is it gonna be Tom, whatever? Um, I, that is not something culturally that's really out there a whole lot. Um, I don't personally think it like diminishes the romance at all. I think life can be, you know, invigorating and fun because of what you're getting from different people and they bring you to whomever you end up with, you know? Um, but yeah, it's certainly not, you know, that storybook notion of there being your, your one true pairing uh, definitely was perpetuated still, at least in the literary world. Um, those of you who've written books, did you leave any stories on like the cutting room floor that you didn't include and how did you decide like which ones would make the book? So many. I, my manuscript was 450 pages long when this guy has horse acquired it and now it's 312. Um, and it, all of those were, none of that was, you know, developmental things about her character. Those were all straight chapters of different men. Um, and making the choice was, was a little difficult because it's hopefully subtle and not heavy handed, but each person is in there for a reason. And I felt like each person from each experience from my life got translated to the page because I felt like there was a message. Like if you sort of read really, really closely, I feel like there is something that gets learned from each person. Um, and the way that I ended up cutting mostly had to do if I felt like those messages that it boiled down to were too related or duplicative. I think you also learn a lot about yourself you know, with those experiences also, and you definitely show that in your book. I think you also learn what you don't want. You're For like, sure. you know what, that guy is what I don't want, but he has like this quality that I do like, and I think you learn from each guy until you find you're like, oh, this guy kind of has what I do like, some things I don't like, but you can look past it. I think it all comes down to timing, going back to your the one question. For sure. Right. And whether dating prepares you for marriage, because yeah. that's how you learn what you want and what you don't want. Yeah. Got time for about two more questions. Coming on back. So I was listening to the Invisibilia podcast a few days ago, and um, and they were talking about this one app that a guy developed because he was really disappointed with the dating world, and it's called Settle for Love. Um, I don't know if you guys heard of it, but essentially you kind of list your pros and cons. And the intention is that when you go into a date, like you know that the person isn't great in these kinds of 
ways and it could be everything from like super super personal things to just kind of more broadly like I don't make that much money so how do you feel about having an app that that's um, that's as honest as that I think that's really interesting. Um, when I worked as a matchmaker, I always asked people what their deal breakers were. And sometimes they would include things, you know, like I'm not confident about this aspect of my life or whatever whatever their insecurities were. Um, I think it makes people more self-aware to do that. I think the problem is that a lot of people aren't self-aware enough to do that. So yeah, I would agree. I would agree with that. We have time for one last question coming up front. Hi. Um, so say that you're kind of like the opposite of what Sammy said, where you're, you're the opposite of your generation. You live in a world where, hypothetically, you go to NYU also, and <laughs> you're actually afraid, like dating apps kind of scare you, or you've had bad experiences, and you're kind of more old fashioned. You want to meet people naturally and have those, you know, kinesthetic, just like easy relationships, but it's just really difficult. What would you say is the best advice you can give for somebody dealing with this kind of thing? The best love advice you could give? Well, first I would ask you why dating apps scare you. It's New York. <laughs> just a lot. It, it's no just, one's gonna yeah. murder you. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, is it? Is it that? I thought. I thought. Is it, in, it? Is it like because of the intimidation factor? Is it because of the safety factor? It's that, and also just the fact that it's like you know, it, within like this generation, I think that just living around at least a college kids right now, it's like there's a whole factor of hookup culture and you're afraid that it might be a superficial connection or you've tried to make a really good connection and then it turned out the opposite. Right, I, but I don't, I mean, it's my understanding that apps have very specific characteristics. They do and a lot of people, you know, state on apps, whether they're there for a hookup or something casual or if they're looking for something more, I'd say if that's the case and you want something more and you kind of want to like weed out the people that are just looking for hookups, that if you're on the app, you or you should state in your profile, not not looking for just a hookup, I'm looking for something real. And trust me, that will diminish a lot, a lot. That, will, that will remove a lot of people because they don't want to waste their time. So that's a good way to go about it if you do go on the apps. Um, if you're not on the apps and you want to meet people outside your social circle, so, circle, I would say expand your social circles. I would say do things that you like to do, engage in activities that you you know that that um, that you're into, so that you can meet like-minded people. You touch upon it on your book too a lot. <laughs> it's a recurring thread and theme in the book, um, Allison. Um, is a little apprehensive. She'd always have these long-term relationships, these like back-to-back three-year things, and um, and the idea of of jumping into like the physical sexual side of it quickly is intimidating to her. Um, and so she invent she comes up with this very um, oft referred to pants speech in the book, um, which essentially is just her getting to like the doorstep at the end of her date and saying like, I really like you, I think this date is going well, like totally happy to keep making out upstairs, but my pants aren't coming off and I just wanna be clear about it now. And it's obviously like a really awkward thing to do. Um, and I think if she was more elegant, like probably wouldn't be saying that. I said this in real life, this was my pants speech, but, oh. but I feel like I that it, you know, it was surprising. I, I had a lot of conversations about it with friends and everyone thought it would never work, right? Like, oh, well, you're never gonna get past a second date ever. Um, and in my experience, as mirrored in Allison's in the book, you would be very surprised. It almost, it basically turned off one person who was very clear about it and very cordial and everybody else was sort of um, happy to slow down and go at her pace. And that was like, a, to me, that was a very delight. It was actually one of the reasons I also wrote the book, because I felt like that can be, one of my friends in the front row is like nodding right now. We talked about the fans speech all the time. Um, I love over, the fans speech. I so really like, do. Um, I'm sorry that I'm getting flustered by her presence. But um, <laughs> essentially, we felt like, wow, that's a good message. People should know that the pants speech works, because if there are other people like us out there, um, why not embrace it and be upfront? It doesn't mean you, you can't date. And it doesn't also mean you're a Puritan. It just means like, maybe Tinder's not the right app for you, you know? And also, or like, are we on the same page or not? Like, yeah. if my pants be just gonna scare you away and you're never gonna call me again, then bye. Right, yeah, and like, why not be upfront about it? You don't need to like have an awkward conversation behind closed doors, right? Right. So. And if someone says, if you're like, hi, I don't wanna sleep with you, and they're like, mm, sorry, that's clearly not someone you want in your life anyway. Right. Can't do that stuff in 2018. Or 17. I think that's about all we have time for. Thank you all for this wonderful event. <laughs>